Norwood School Committee meeting of Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019. Could you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first order of business is approval of the minutes from the May 8th meeting. Do I have a motion? Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Thank you, Maura. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, I'll put it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you very much. Dr. Thompson, do we have correspondence? We do not, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, for the committee, we do have warrants this evening. We have two payroll warrants, one in the amount of $1,394,112.08 and another for $99,737.07. One buildings and grounds warrant in the amount of $25,591.53. A food services warrant in the amount of $41,103.41. And four accounts payable warrants, one for $758,125.48, one for $10,954.62, one for $118,920.12, and the last one for $90,417.62, for a grand total of $2,538,961.93. So I will ask the committee to sign at your convenience. Um, next item of business is um, public forum. At this time, we invite members of the public forward to speak to us about anything under the purview of the school committee. Is there anyone here who would like to speak at public forum? Seeing none, I will declare public forum closed. Um, any announcements today, Dr. Thompson? Uh, I will save them for the superintendent's report, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, so the next thing is um, I'd like to invite Mr. Brian Riley up because we are here at the Prescott School this evening. I want to thank the Prescott students for the wonderful cards that they left for each of us at these places. It's really wonderful to be welcomed to the school. Um, so, Mr. Riley. All right. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Wyatt, <laughs> Ms. Ellis. Welcome to the Prescott. Um, it's my pleasure to host you today as part of our, your Traveling School Committee series. I want to just start our short um, discussion tonight with a um, presentation from three of our third graders. A few months ago, all of the third grade students participated in a wax museum where they were asked to research, present, and act as a historical character of their choosing. Three third graders are here today to share with you their experiences with the Max Wax Museum. They are Ari Bletzer from the Seacoast class, come on up. Reagan Hart from Mrs. Hatchie and Mrs. Fitzgerald's class. And Shay Morad from Mrs. Condon's class. I'll turn it over to the three girls to give you an overview of their experience. Hi, I'm Ariana Bletzer, I'm Reagan Hart, and I'm Shay Morad. Welcome to the third grade Wax Museum presentation. Third grade wax museum happened in February. interrupt you girls for just a minute can you guys hear the them all right great I just want to make sure everybody could hear you all right. doing a great job <laughs> and press 
about the video that you produced. How did you get the Prescott School in the background? What tools did you use to do that? Green screen. So tell us a little more about what that is. Um, the green screen is um, this little screen we have in the, in the gym. And it's, and it's kind of like a projector. And you can change the background to anything you want. All right. Any other questions from the committee for the third graders? So who did each of you do in the Blacks Museum? I was Kelly I was Princess Diana. I was Frida Kahlo. Wow. Very well done. Nice <laughs> job. All right. Thank you, girls. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so I also want to take a few minutes while I have a captive audience um, <laughs> to share a few highlights from this year and share with you some exciting happenings here at the Prescott. In my first year as principal, it's been my priority to get beyond the statistics and see what truly makes the Prescott tick. While I had the opportunity last summer to pour over historical data and rosters, it's hard to truly understand a school community with a stack of papers and an empty, I should say, hot building. <laughs> I worked this year to get my hands dirty, literally. Sometimes I leave the cafeteria with milk all over myself and <laughs> ketchup packet stains and Go-Gurts are also hard to open. Um, <laughs> but by visiting classrooms on a daily basis and routinely having lunch with students and building relationships with my colleagues here in the building. Without a doubt, I've loved every minute of it. At last year's school committee meeting here at Prescott, Principal Killian shared exciting technology initiatives that were well underway, including the video club, yearbook, tech buddies, and the extensive use of both the Google Classroom and the Seesaw Parent Communication Tool. All of these exciting programs have continued this year and have gained popularity over the course of the year. The successful use of technology here at Prescott has certainly been well documented over time, so I'll speak to some of the other exciting opportunities we've offered students and staff here this year. There are three exciting new efforts that we've worked on to, that we've worked on to establish this year, and I want to share those with the committee. 
First, we've worked to establish a strong whole school professional learning community, or PLC, to advance our collective instructional approach in two targeted ways. First, all classroom teachers participated in instructional rounds this year to gather ideas, spark questions that they had for their peers, and to see the excellent teaching that was happening just next door. This process included grade level teams discussing short term instructional goals and vi visiting other classrooms to gather ideas and evidence for their own implementation. When I asked a veteran Prescott teacher if they had ever participated in something like that, they said that after teaching here for more than a decade, they had never actually seen a colleague teach a lesson. Teachers walked away from this experience singing the praise of their colleagues and excited about some new ideas that they could take back to their own classrooms. Second, we established a voluntary book club that meets twice a month before school. When I offered the staff this opportunity, I figured we may have three or four enthusiastic teachers. In the first book club, we started off with 12 teachers and quickly grew to 14 with our second book. Our first book, Making Thinking Visible, examined ways that teachers can challenge students to explain their thinking through specific, stra sp specific collaborative strategies. Our second book, Smart But Scattered, has sparked some great conversations around building executive functioning skills in all of our students, not just those with a defined disability. Our book club meetings are often loud, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, energetic and truly collaborative. It's a good thing we meet before the kids get here. We've worked to build a supportive professional community where we are all vulnerable, supportive, and working as a team to share ideas and do what's best for our kids. A second area of focus this year has been the establishment of our school garden program. We've been fortunate to establish great community partners with the Lowe's and Dedham and the Norwood DPW who have both provided supplies to get this program off the ground. The first stage of the project will be the construction and planting of our first round of garden beds which should take place in the next week. And additionally, we'll be starting our composting from the cafeteria before the end of this school year. We've received two composting bins from the DPW and will be teaching students how to compost their food scraps during lunch once a week. In the long term, we look for students to establish a direct connection to what the students are learning in the area of environmental literacy to the school garden program here. While flowers are pretty, our goal is to maintain 80% of our beds as edible foods that will be consumed by those who plant them. In the coming week, we'll be planting a variety of lettuces, tomatoes, and a few pumpkins. <laughs> Finally, we've undergone a classroom library inventory and refresh this spring. This year, we spent some time examining the texts that are housed in each of our classroom libraries that students are free to borrow and return whenever they choose. We found that there were many classics such as Where the Red Fern Grows, Charlotte's Web, and Dr. Seuss books that were in rough shape. In addition to purchasing a new physical copy of worn out books, I've also challenged teachers to look for recently published within the last 15 years books, as well as ones that reflect our greater school community. We've asked ourselves the question, can our students find multiple books in their classroom libraries where they can relate to the main character? This is an ongoing effort and hopefully something will continue on a smaller scale each year. As we look to the future, our team will continue to be challenged by a number of things. First, we're fortunate to have a growing English language learner population here at Prescott. In the past five years, the number has risen dramatically from 5% of our population in 2015 to nearly 20% today. While we have a gifted and well-respected EL teacher here at Prescott, we're constantly challenged to provide our students with the support that they deserve in our classrooms. Additionally, our team continues to find ways to get creative and innovative in the area of English language arts. Without a concrete curriculum to provide clarity, direction, and resources, teachers are left to pull resources from a variety of places. When we talk about everyone rowing in the same direction, I relate what we're doing now to paddling a boat with our hands rather than a proper instrument, a paddle. Imagine what would be possible if we were provided the proper tools to support teachers in this area. Finally, we're excited to look at our collaborative planning structures to provide teachers with the ability to routinely share ideas, investigate innovative and new approaches, and examine student data. While this is part of our district's five-year plan, I hope to take significant steps in this area in advance of next school year. I appreciate your support of our team here at Prescott and would welcome any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Are there questions from the committee? All right. Well, I, you know, let's follow sure. uh, So your growing plants, are you integrating that with uh, the science of how they get there? Yes. Yeah, the Norwood Science Center is fantastic. Actually, in our first grade classrooms now, we have a number of sunflowers growing um, and taking a look at what they need to be able to grow and maybe what things 
um, inhibit their growing, um, and looking at really pushing out maybe some test beds. So talking about if we plant tulip bulbs in different places in terms of flowers, what will impact that? Um, if we grow certain plants next to each other, is that beneficial or detrimental to their growth? Um, and really having kids make hypotheses and test them to see um, what actually happens. The goal would be for our kids to walk away from here, go home to their parents and say, I would love to start a small garden in the backyard. That could be a container garden, it could be a massive garden, um, but that is something that we're hoping to make that direct connection. One of the things um, that we've looked at over time is always great um, sometimes great on social media to be able to sort of see what the DPW t puts out in terms of um, what's contaminated recycling, um, the different zones in town that are labeled red as that they need some diversion help, um, and consistently the area here around the Prescott is one of those areas that needs help. Um, there's trash that ends up in the recycle, so hopefully trying to find ways to educate kids that can maybe in a nice way hold their families accountable for recycling um, <laughs> is some ownership that kids our age that we that we we work with um, could definitely do. Thank you so much, Mr. Riley. If Dr. Could, Thompson? Yeah, if I could just add, and, and, and Mr. Riley is being quite uh, humble, but you know, he's he's come into the Prescott, instantaneously made connections, uh, got the staff, and continued to build the community that was here. Uh, and it really is an incredible place to visit. And you know, the staff is, has met him you know, and um, doing fine work here. So I, you know, and uh, above and beyond what you would normally expect from a first year principal. So I want to congratulate you for an excellent year uh, and, and continuing the good work here at the Prescott. Thank you. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Um, with the committee's permission, I'd like to With the committee's permission, I'd like to move up um, policy to the next item because uh, Joe Kidd is here to support our discussion on that, and I know that he has another commitment that he's trying to make it to. Okay. So, um, Teresa, did you want to talk about policy? I hope this is a quick one. I never know, but I think it should be one of the easier policies we work through. Um, so you should have in front of you um, two different drafts of policy IJNDD, uh, which is our social networking policy. Um, the one on top in red, it says update for review. So that's the one we want to look at mostly tonight, but you do have the original um, policy as well for your, for your reference. Uh, so I'll start and then Mr. Kidd, you know, chime in if there's other things you think I've forgotten. Um, but Dr. Thompson had asked that we looked at this policy. Uh, he attended a conference session, I think through text, um, on social media and said that we should take a look and just brush it up because um, it hadn't been touched since 2014, I believe. Yes, 2014. Um, so Mr. Kidd and I just went through it and we tightened up some of the language, um, specified, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, communication between any staff, not just teacher, but any you know, public school staff and you know one-on-one -on -one to students or one-on-one -on -one to their parents um, is required uh, to be done using the NORA public school email address. Um, before, it was just strongly encouraged, so we changed that language to now being required. Um, if you go through the document, there's some very minor changes that we made, again, just tightening up that language. Um, you know, specifying that we really don't want our staff to communicate one-on-one -on -one through social media. Um, and, you know, we listed current social media apps today, like Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, but obviously those will evolve and change. So this policy really applies to any social media use. Um, there's one question still remaining on the first page under two, you'll see it highlighted. Was our attorney able to get that? Okay, so we're, yeah. we're waiting for some language and we will away from that one statement. Um, but otherwise, <laughs> as you read through the policy, do you have questions or concerns with anything that you read? Laura? Uh, just one question. Uh, in the beginning of the third paragraph, mm -hmm. uh, in addition, any online communication using, using one's own personal resources as opposed to school district resources compromises the teachers as well as the school district's ability to retain public records in accordance with the requirements of the Commonwealth's public records law. I was just curious, um, the resources felt 
a little vague to me. I wasn't sure if we wanted to say, are we, it, it strikes me that we're referring here specifically to email. <clears throat> um, I think that uh, we use the word resources because it's not just necessarily email that okay. parents are using or that teachers are using to contact students and parents. We're talking about okay. um, uh, our student information system uh, okay. is used a lot through Aspen. Uh, there's tons of contact through Aspen right. um, from teachers to, um, uh, which is actually runs through our email system. Okay. So it does get archived. Um, so I think the word resources is used just because um, there's not, it's not, communication doesn't flow just through the, through the email system. Right. So I, I guess my concern was less about like what our resources are yes. and what the teacher's resources are. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because you're saying like communicating using one's own personal resources. I just, like if I were a teacher, I'd be like, what exactly does that mean? Is right. That like, so I was just wondering if you keep resources for the school communication to right. specify what you mean by the teacher's communication there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is, is that what we were talking about, like their um, personal email, personal Facebook? Right. I, th like I think what we're saying there, and if I, I, I can't find the, where's the, uh, the, I just want to see what the exact a, wording is. It's the second, second paragraph second under paragraph two, and he sentence. actually didn't change that. It's the original wording that, that yeah. was referencing It's not right any change. This oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, we should definitely take a look at that. Um, I mean, basically what we're trying to say here, or what we're trying to tighten up is that we don't want anybody using their own resources. Right. Yeah. But, you know, so um, I think we'll just have to take a look at that language and, okay. and tighten yeah. that up again, yeah. Just in, light of what, just in light of what you just said, the sentence right after that says, the, the only thing that they're actually required to use is their Nord Public School email accounts. But we're really talking about everything, right? Well, or no? I think this is saying that you're required to use Nora Public School email. Like, obviously, that means you shouldn't be using a personal email, but I think that also means you shouldn't be using a Facebook group and you shouldn't be using. Mm -hmm. So, it's like, it needs to go through email. <coughs> Okay, I just wonder if we want to think about expanding that because right. you could have a class Facebook group, right, where they're doing homework. I things. think that's exactly what they're saying. We don't want. Yeah, we don't. Want okay, so yeah. we we don't want there to be but, a school. But they do use Google Classroom, right? Yeah. Which okay. is a school resource, which is kind of connected to the yeah, uh, same email idea. system, same sort of thing, Google Apps, yeah. right? Um, and, and those are the sort of the resources that we're encouraging use okay. of, not you know a teacher creating uh, their own personal Facebook group. You know, even though it's a you know Facebook group for school, if they're creating it through their own account, right? Using however they set that up. Okay. That's what we're trying to. And I think again, having this discussion, maybe we have to relook at that language and make it make sure it's clear. And I think no matter what, and I, oh, I talked to, we talked about this, is that uh, whatever comes out of this, there needs to be follow up with teachers as far as like clarification and training mm -hmm. is concerned. We can't just say, hey, take a look at this policy and follow it, right? It's, uh, you know, there should be um, talk about uh, um, training and discussion. Um, we did have a conversation about, we, we, we had a, a few different school district examples, um, which tended, some of those school district examples were very, very uh, detailed and very stringent in a lot of ways. And um, it was one of those things, is if we, we had the choice where we wanted to maybe tighten up this current uh, policy and language according to the uh, superintendent's specifications, or do we want to really delve into it and take a look at overhauling it? And if that's the case, um, then there needs to be uh, a lot more communication about that, especially with teachers and with the community about what that looks like. Um, and as well as uh, maybe a, a conversation about an overall communication policy, not just social media communication, but an overall communication policy in the Norwood Public Schools as to you know, what tools are being used to communicate with parents, um, not just from teachers, but from principals and from uh, administration, um, because there are a lot of different tools that teachers and administration are using to communicate with parents and um, you know, that, besides social media, between remind, text mes messaging, 
uh, to the Blackboard Connect to smaller newsletters. You know, what does that all look like, and how do we, um, how do we, and do we want to, you know, control that a little more as far as making sure that parents don't have to go to like seven different systems to get, you know, information about their classroom and their school in their schools and the same with students as well so I mean there could be uh, I think this leads us in a direction and in, in, uh, Stewart can correct me if I'm wrong I think we thought the best way to go was to have this initial conversation about tightening up the language and then uh, moving forward uh, starting the conversation of a, a larger communication policy within the North Public Schools. Laura? Uh, one thing I would say just in terms of the tightening up the language versus the larger communication yeah. policy. My, just listening to you talk, I, it, it struck me just how many different platforms we might really be talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Because even outside of the sort of obvious social media ones, right, a lot of teachers have websites that they run right. for their classroom or their program yep. Yep. that's gonna be like based off of Wix or Weebly or something like that. That's right. outside of the North Public Schools right. resources. But I don't think we would consider that their personal resources because exactly. it's not like it's their website. Right. So I, I sort of, I guess part of my concern is like it's a weird thing where I think getting too specific, mm -hmm. it, you're going to get like deeply into the weeds. Right. <laughs> but I feel like this right now is almost a little too vague. Mm -hmm. um, so I would almost say it might, and I don't know if this would be like sending out a Google form of to teachers, yeah. how, like really how are you communicating? And then we look at how are those communications really happening and see what do we need to address in terms of policy. Yeah. Um, I mean, because I think it's pretty obvious the, I mean, it should be, but to you know put in here of like, obviously not, you shouldn't be personally tweeting your students. You shouldn't be Instagramming them, Snapchatting. Like that I think is the more clear cut things. Yeah. But I suspect that where we need a broader communications policy is that I think there's a lot more gray area. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I guess that was sort of what I was getting at with the own personal resources is yep. like, there's so much that that could mean right. that I feel like I would read that and be like, wait, but if I'm setting up the Remind app, does that mean I'm not supposed to? Right. Right. Or, okay. or if I, I, I have a, you know, I use my Twitter account to right. talk about, you know, my school or mm -hmm. my classroom, and it's my personal Twitter account because right. I was in this, another school district before, right. and I have, you know, 250 followers already. Right. Now I have to, you know, create an entirely new Twitter account right. just for the Northern Public Schools. Right. Just, you know, so there is a lot of that. And, and that's exactly what we talked about, where you can go down that rabbit hole of, mm -hmm. you know, okay, you know, what are we talking about yeah. here? And I think one of the first steps we talked about was, okay, there needs to be uh, a survey sent out to teachers yeah. and administrators that say, okay, how are you communicating with your, with your parents and with your students? Mm -hmm. And what are all the modes of communications that, that you're using? And then taking a look at that data, putting together a committee, again, made up of administrators and teachers for their mm -hmm. feedback on okay what you know what direction should we be going in right. as, as part of this in, in what you know what tools are we saying to use and for what purposes right, right? so you, you know the blackboard connects is, is used for all school announcements or grade level announcements or something along those mm -hmm. lines but you know your email is used for these situations yeah. Yeah. and there's also something in here that we kept in here as well as is that there also needs to be sort of that leeway of there's going to be situations where mm -hmm. Um, you know, a teacher might need to use their cell phone to contact a student if they're on, a, on, a, uh, on an out-of-state field trip or, um, you know, there's an emergency or something like that. We don't want somebody saying, well, I, I can't use my cell phone right. because they yeah. said it in policy, you know. <laughs> I was going to say, with the, in terms of doing a survey, I think the other people that you need to make sure are included in that are coaches. Coaches, because right. Because I feel like that's an area where it gets mm -hmm. even more no there there is you know there's a lot of the high school teams i know that the team has a group chat group chat, a group chat via text yep. and then oftentimes the coach will reach out to the captain and send information and then the captain sends that out yes. through the group chat mm -hmm. and then there's things like yep. um when i was volunteering for mica or um the mica choral competition mm -hmm. uh we had set up an app that we were using just with this, all the student volunteers so that sure. I was running the registration desk and I could say, hey, another group came in, I need a student volunteer here and now. And I don't think anybody had any problem with that, but it's one more thing where right. we were trying to 
find a way to communicate with students. And you get to that issue where, okay, well, well, the, the microgroup's using WhatsApp. Uh, how come they can they can do that, and and uh, we're not allowed to use, you know, whatever, right? Yeah. So there's that question is, is like what situations can certain things be used in what does need to be and there needs to be some sort of legal some legal conversations as well what does need to be archived um, as far as public records are concerned and um, what that looks like in the costs associated with that as well yeah dr. Thompson yeah just uh, so just, just to kind of go back a little bit this is this is kind of coming from two different directions one is the um, is the risk assessment task force that we were involved with in the training that was involved over, over the year to look uh, at our at our uh, risk assessment procedures. And the, I believe it was Cambridge policy came, came out of that and realized that there was a, a distinct difference. Mm -hmm. The other was uh, Andrea Vaughn. 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 Vaughn came and you know had several questions from parents. Well, what's the what's the communication policy about one to one communication? So there's, so there's a couple things. So. You know, the social media, the ways of communicating is evolving quicker than we can continue to write policy. So, so that's one. The other piece is you want to communicate in a way, and in a, you know, two parents, two families, in a way that they're going to consume it. Because we could, we could send mailings home, but no one's going to open the mail and read it at this point if we wanted to stay back there. So keeping ahead of the way people consume information, but yet also creating, you know, a, a a set of rules where, where we define what is appropriate conversations and communication and ways that are, are doing it. You know, if, if it's a big group thing like, like Twitter, where you're announcing things to, to the Twitter sphere, to the, you know, uh, that probably is not one thing, but direct messaging would not be okay. You would want to use email for that. So it's, it's kind of defining, you know, what's acceptable, what the parameters are, and how, they're going, how, how it's going to happen. And, it, and it, you know, it, it's difficult, but we want to make sure our, our children are safe, communication is effective, teachers have that, um, that line drawn between their personal space and their professional space, uh, and, but I believe that if we define that for teachers, they will pretty much follow. But, but you're right about, you know, the, you know, the group, basically people are getting their information, most, some through email, and let, you know, kids will listen. Will take emails if they know they're getting something from an old person because kids don't use email. Mm -hmm. They use you know Snapchat, which I'm not promoting, mm -hmm. text messages, um, and, and Twitter. So, how how are you going to get out? You know, and you mentioned the the um, the uh, Remind app, which is kind of blind when you can send something out to a group and your your personal mobile phone number is not broadcasted, that people sign up to get the message from Remind. Um, so there are ways to do it that fits into a parameter, but it really is about you know, setting what is appropriate communication and what you know, sphere and, and way, and then helping people make the connections is this constantly going to be changing. So. so Teresa, what were you hoping to accomplish with our conversation today? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly more work. Um, <laughs> no, so Joe and I had already talked about this is probably the first step in that larger piece, but coming off of the two things that Dr. Thompson mentioned, the risk assessment and Andrea's um, talk, we just wanted to initially and immediately fine tune that one-on-one -on -one student and staff uh, communication. So I think with this policy, um, you know, I took some notes on, on what you were saying, Mara, about that, the word resources, and I can work with Joe to fine tune that. Again, we are still waiting for the attorney to get back to us on that one phrase, but is there anything else in what you see in front of you that you think we need to add or delete from this policy? And then Joe and I can figure out a timeline for that larger one, which probably would be totally fast, right, that we would or we would want it maybe up and running in the fall? Is that what you're talking about? Um, I think it, we can discuss and okay. figure out what. Okay. Is there okay. anything on the policy in front of you that anybody else wants us to look further into or at it? No. Joe? Uh, I don't have anything to look further into, but number four reads, uh, it, it reads unclear to me. So okay. you may want to like run that by a couple more people in. Is there, um, do, do you all have, uh, I don't know, maybe we can uh, give everybody access to the Google Doc and they can maybe add some comments. Okay. You know, so we could, and then we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That way. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you. Um, any other questions for Mr. Kidd? All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's go back then um, to Mr. Bauer. Can you join us, please? See you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. Can you identify yourself for us? Please? Yes, my name is James Bowers. Uh, I'm the president of NFACT, uh, which is a nonprofit organization here in Norwood that um, supports and promotes the fine arts programs in our public schools. Uh, and I'm here tonight to present the board with a uh, check um, for our seat dedication fundraiser. Uh, anybody who's been in the um, auditorium at the high school has probably noticed it on the armrests. In some places, there are these little black brass plaques with different people's names or names of businesses, organizations, um, and that's a fundraiser that we've been running. Uh, we're wrapping up our fifth year now, uh, so we started in 2014, uh, another time of budget crisis. Yes. Uh, and um, anyone who wants to uh, support the fine arts uh, can order one of these plaques uh, for an individual or a family. It's $100. Um, for a business or organization, that's two hundred and fifty dollars, and uh, the money goes um, to uh, North Public Schools, earmarked for for fine arts. Uh, so tonight, I'm presenting a check for eighteen hundred and fourteen dollars and fifty cents, uh, which represents nineteen uh, plaques minus the cost of actually purchasing them, which is four fifty of these. Thank you so much. Are there um, any questions or comments from the committee? Thank More? you. Uh, just to thank you and your committee for your work and thank to you. everyone who's donated. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Um, so is there a motion to approve this donation? Thank you, Mara. Is there a second? Thank you, Joan. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Okay. Um, Next, we are going to talk about the elementary school handbooks. Oh, Mr. Riley, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm here tonight representing the elementary principals team. Um, I was told it was an honor to do this. <laughs> uh, I wonder if that's the case. <laughs> um, so the el elementary principals team has met multiple times to review both the blue pages and the white pages. Um, to offer a little bit of sort of insight into the difference between those two. The blue pages are those that are school specific and outline procedures such as where to drop off and pick up kids, as well as some PTO and school council information. Um, so for this year, aside from administrative changes like updates of dates and the composition of PTO boards, there won't be any substantial updates to any of our elementary blue changes. I know that there was two schools, I think the Balch and the Willett slash LMPA that did a major overhaul last year um, with a couple of their areas. So this year there's nothing to present to you aside from, like I said, some date cleanup um, and updates to PTO and school council boards. Um, the elementary white pages outline in detail rel relevant Massachusetts general laws and district policies as well as important calendar dates. There are a few minor changes to this document, none of which reflect a change of substance. Um, so the following revisions have been made on page 36 um, and where present in other locations in the white pages. Any references to, to the Willett School will be struck in the event that that school closes. On page 37, the emergency protocol language has been updated to reflect the names and procedures of the drills that are used. We routinely discuss and practice these procedures with our public safety partners and our staff. And on pages 40 and 43, future dates for report cards and state mandated testing have been updated for the 2019-2020 school year. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Change, but I'm just trying to remember what we reviewed last year. Sure. Um, 
I think in the blue pages, it's where some schools reference that you can bring your bike and some don't. Is that correct? Yes, um, yes there has been some differences in that. Okay. Um, that are That is where they are housed in the blue pages. And is that something that, as a district, we wanted to look into? Because I know we received questions from some parents, I believe it was at the Old Ham, a couple months ago, um, about why can't their children ride their bike um, or roller skate to school. Um, is that a discussion that happened more amongst the principals, like why there are those differences in the five schools? Um, that's not a discussion we had, but I'm sure that we're happy to do that and make changes or come back and present those changes to you if, if there are because there is not consistency from my understanding. Right, no, there definitely is not consistency. And, and there may be a reason why there mm -hmm. isn't consistency because each of our schools is in a different location and has different concerns with traffic and things like that. So um, I don't know that, you know, in the same way that our drop, -up, drop off policies are different at different schools, it might be that mm -hmm. it does make sense to have different policies about some other things as well. but. Um, it is definitely something that we would like to make sure is at least considered. Absolutely. Yeah. So other question? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, they fooled you. No, no worries. <laughs> uh, 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 no. I'll, I'll figure out a way to get back. <laughs> I saw Nancy earlier. I was like, you coming tonight? She's like, no, just Brian tonight. I was yep. like, your name's on our agenda. All of you are on our agenda. They get credit for being here. <laughs> um, so just a couple questions, concerns. I, I know it wasn't updated this year. Um, some of these I had asked um, last year, and I know there was some discussion around it, too. Um, one area is like with the elementary discipline code. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering if you can share more information with us like from pages 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, like that area. Um, is there consistency amongst the schools? Is there anything with this policy that we should look at more closely in terms of like the in-school suspension versus the long-term long suspension versus like the emergency of removal? These are all directly out of legislation, so, and they have not changed since those were put in. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, because this is the exact area that I have concern with as well, so which part of this is directly from legislation? Starting from 19 to 23? Uh, starting with uh, 20, due process, short-term okay. suspension, long-term suspension, out-of-school suspension. Yeah, those do reference the right. uh, uh, 22, in-school suspension, and 23, emergency removal. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the bullying law. Mm -hmm. So up through the middle, Middle, yeah, the three quarters of the way through 24. And like word, word for word is directly law, or we're just referencing the law. Yeah, that is that is the, the, that is chapter 222 or chapter 37 and three quarters. That was a change four or five years ago okay. for suspension and, and process for suspension. And I would imagine that originally when it was put into the handbooks, it was done with legal counsel. I was not here when that would have happened, but based on the language, it's pretty much universal from what I've seen elsewhere. Perhaps it would, I mean, go I ahead. Can, I can dive in. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how I want to proceed. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> gonna bulldoze here. Um, on page 13, cell phones and electronic devices. It says, I'm just gonna read what's here. Uh, all cell phones and other electronic devices must be often in backpacks and may not be used during the school day without the principal's permission. If parents must contact their child during the school day for an urgent matter, they should go through the office. Um, what's the consequence if they have a cell phone? Yeah. So typically, I can speak for myself. Um, typically it's a conversation with the kid and typically mm -hmm. a notification to the family okay. of what the policy is. Um, in fact, this happened recently, a kid had their cell phone out, they were trying to text their parent, it mm -hmm. was close to the end of the school day. Um, but I think for us it's a growth and if it continues and it, then we start to look at more um, 
I don't want to say punitive, but more sort of things to make sure that that happens. So making sure that it's in the backpack, mm -hmm. making sure that um, the kids actually understand why they're not having cell phones, especially in elementary school. Right. So I guess that, that's a little bit part of my concern. And I, I don't mean to sound, I totally understand that not every principal wants to be here. Mm -hmm. I actually find it a little frustrating that they're not here okay. because part of what I would like to know is if there is consistency mm -hmm. with how the handbook is being implemented. And a little bit, if there isn't, that's kind of what I need to know, mm -hmm. is that are there areas where there are major differences that that would what, to my mind, is what would need to be addressed. Be reflected, so that yeah. there is a little bit more clarity. Mm -hmm. Because of course you can only speak to what happens in your building. Yeah. But that's kind of why I point out this one, because to me it's like, well yes, of course cell phones and electronic devices should be often in their backpacks. Mm -hmm. But like, is there a policy, I mean, or is it something we have to talk about where if it's a consistent problem, that student has to leave it in the office mm -hmm. or, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it is. Because I think a little bit this reads this, the, the, limit, the, the limiting nature of this section here feels not up to date with where we are in terms of electronics in our elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Like, totally made sense two, three years ago. Sure. It strikes me that it doesn't really make sense now. Mm -hmm. um, and if you flip to page 19, my, I, I'm concerned with the discipline code, frankly. And part of what I'm concerned with is that I feel like it's laid out very, very clearly what the rights are of the student, as it should be. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's laid out very clearly what the expectations are of the administrative team in terms of when certain instances happen mm -hmm. to make sure that there is consistency. Like for instance, on page 21, we go through very clearly what a student has the right to do if an out of school suspension is even broached. Mm -hmm. Like we're having a hearing, they can bring in witnesses, they can refute, like they're 10. We're having like a trial, right. I totally get it. And that's within the law and I'm, I'm there, but I feel like if I'm a parent or a student, I know clearly what my responsibility are and my rights are. Mm -hmm. But then if you flip to 19, it's, um, Students are responsible for their actions and need to be held accountable for their decisions, 100%. How are we doing that? Mm -hmm. I mean, we see like the what the options are, but I don't know as I read this what constitutes that option. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like understand. what's pushing us from one to the next? Mm -hmm. And then further down, um, referrals to administration for disciplinary action could result in but are not limited to the following. And then it sort of lays out a list of possibilities, but my concern is it's not like, if there's an incident that constitutes this, this is where we're going to. Mm -hmm. Does yeah. that make sense? Understood, yep. That's my, I feel like it's very specific, obviously because that's the law for mm -hmm. parents and students. If I were a parent and I were concerned to make sure that discipline is happening um, consistently throughout all of the buildings, this would not make me feel better. Understood. It sounds like, you know, thinking about about a situation happening and what the response would be, would be from each school, this doesn't leave a lot of sort of detailed information. Um, so it sounds like this is a section that maybe we can mark up a little bit, obviously with the assistance of legal counsel and mm -hmm. making sure that we're tying all that in um, and come back and present something that's a little bit more balanced in terms of the school side and the student side. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Thompson? Yeah, the, the, you know, and you know, I have to go back to when the law was written. They specifically did not want if you do this, mm -hmm. then this happens because the principal is supposed to, in the part of due process, give the opportunity to hear the other side and for parents and students to, to come in and they're supposed to weigh other circumstances that come into effect. So the way the handbook is supposed to be written is a range of possible things. What is actually going to happen is going to be determined through that conversation. So. To do that would be not in what was expected in the law that was passed. John? So I, 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 I agree that there should be some levels of consistency, but the discretion is really important, right, for the principals. So one way that you could handle that is to give examples, like potential examples. So if in your example, right, the student was texting their parents at the end of the day. So for example, if a student's texting their parents at the end of the day, that will typically result in a conversation with a with the with the principal and a note home, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If a student is sending inappropriate pictures that they've taken in a bathroom, that's going to result, you know, kind of a minimum sanction for that would be, right. you know, we're moving to that step. Mm -hmm. But I, I do strongly feel like there has to be that level of discretion for yeah. for the principals, and I just want to make sure we don't 
no, tip down I, the opposite way. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that it has to be, this happens, this is automatically the yeah. punishment. That's not what I'm okay. saying. I'm just feeling like, to me, we've gone a little bit too far in the opposite direction, whereas I feel like we're, like, I just don't see that there's anything sort of guiding it at all to make sure that there is consistency in terms of, and my, I guess my overall concern is that making sure that if, if something happens at one school, I wouldn't want it to be a case where a, something happens at one school and a punishment is laid out and the same or very similar incident at an opposite school is getting a totally different punishment. Yeah. Now, obviously, I'm not arguing that it should be like yeah. one plus one equals this automatically every time, but I do feel like I would want some, some further guidance here. I just feel like it's a range. lacking of that. So like a range. Yeah. Something. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with Joan that the discretion part is very important. I think yeah, that obviously. some school districts had at one time done, yeah. you know, zero tolerance policies for certain things, and it resulted in things like, you know, kids getting suspended for bringing a butter knife in with their banana. Right. Right. You know, <laughs> zero tolerance. You know, and yeah, we don't want to go there. And I don't think anybody here is trying to go no. there. I just, yeah. you know, it, it it's tricky this balance. I, I think for me, um, I have concerns on like the opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So one, the really serious like emergency removal, because to me that's like a very clear like safety mm -hmm. concern of student, other students, staff, etc. So mm -hmm. I just have more questions around that end of the spectrum. But then on the other end of the spectrum, um, and this is just like child development background coming out of me here, but um, like the loss of recess, um, just professionally bothers me in so many ways um, and there's so much research out now that says you shouldn't use removing resource as a punishment obviously it's a safety concern but for other things like um, you know if, if a child forgot their homework or if they said something that they shouldn't have to a friend and then they're on the wall which I know happens in some of the elementary schools but not all that they lose five ten minutes of recess on the wall um, you know, developmentally speaking, there's tons of research on how that's shaming and we shouldn't shame. And there's a lot of sensory and emotional regulation. And I don't know if any of this has come up yet in like, the SEL task force. No. Um, but like a lot of the research that I just have and in, in, in what I do just strongly says we should not be removing recess in most cases. Mm -hmm. But I know that schools handle that differently. Yeah, so. you're right. And, and forgive me for not knowing about this, but what's the alternative discipline? Well, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so a lot of times behavior um, is rooted in emotion. So if you discipline or you punish a behavior, you're really getting to what's going on. So there's a ton of research looking at like emotional regulation. So are we mindfully responding to the student, helping them manage their emotion, redirect their emotion, really learn for what to do differently next time. Um, I know some of the schools use um, think sheets, which I think is a great tool and a way to you know, help with the emotion redirect behavior. Um, there's some research that looks at like creating rooms for reflection rather than punishment. Um, there's some research that looks at having like uh, restorative practices um, built in instead of punishment, um, having natural consequences instead of punishment. Um, there's some research that looks at having alternative res recess. So if there is a kid who for some reason we felt should not go out and have their usual recess, um, the principals or the adjustment counselor or other people can still provide those children with time to move because um, movement is so important in how they manage everything. And, and I just worry and I, I hear about it throughout town. You know, our kids don't get all that much recess no. in the first place. And my guess is most kids who lost that recess are the kids who actually needed it sure. most mm -hmm. on that day. So, so that's some of my concerns with that practice. Yeah, and I think consequences need to be directly related to what happened and restorative in nature. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of research, like Teresa suggests, that is moving students towards more, and schools more towards restorative practices. Um, and you know, my 
my philosophy is, you know, if, this, if something happens in the classroom and the kid is on the wall, are we expecting a six-year-old to make the direct connection to I broke a pencil in the classroom, so now I'm missing my recess? Um, I would tend to agree that is probably not the healthiest of consequences. Um, all kids need to run around, and in fact, may actually help those kids in the future not break that pencil. Um, but I do think that that is getting back to where this conversation started, is maybe having some more holistic conversations as an elementary administrator team as to putting some of this stuff down on paper about what our approach is. I think looking and digging into some of the SEL work and a lot of these programs that are out there, having um, implemented one in my previous district, come with the sort of mindset and approach of here is what, how we approach school, school level consequences for school rules um, on a very sort of macro, macro level um, and here are some ways in the classroom you know the students that we work with need to learn from their mistakes um, and also need to feel that the adults who are providing some redirection to them um, are there to support them um, and I think sometimes those punitive consequences and again we're talking about the low level stuff of missing your recess um, are sometimes ones that, that these kids can't make a direct correlation to um, and so I think that is where some of this work lives as a school mm -hmm. is figuring out where that happy medium is how do we allow kids to grow from their mistakes Mistakes, um, while also providing some gentle redirection mm -hmm. to that right area and you're right um, a lot of it is um, asking and teaching kids how to employ you know techniques that will help them calm down um, belly breathing or taking a minute to, to recognize that they're upset and naming the emotion um, and sort of going from there and if we can get kids to understand when I'm angry this is kind of how I act but this is how I can get myself back to being regulated that's a huge step that also doesn't happen in a year it also doesn't happen in the heat of the moment when someone's still in their football um, and so you know I hear that, that that's probably also a bigger conversation that we have to have as a team um, to come back and like I said present something that's more consistent or at least a ballpark sort of direction um, that we're moving in the, the only other one concern I had and I had already shared this with Dr. Thompson um, I, I am hoping to see like the middle school and the high school like all of the um, handbooks together mm -hmm. um, last year we had a conversation around you know is there um, alignment and congruency between the three and at the time there wasn't always mm -hmm. um, some of it that conversation last year was around the behavior some was the cell phone use some of it was also the dress code mm -hmm. um, and my concerns I will move more to middle school so I won't yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you those tonight but um, I, I was I, I personally hope to see all three as a package before we approve any of them. Mm -hmm. That's what we had, I think that's what we had been talking about last year, was seeing them all as a package, isn't that right? Oh. Teresa reminded me of that, that's yes. That's what I oh, okay. yeah. um, I think um, we definitely want to see the blue pages. Mm -hmm. um, we can't really approve without at least having seen those. And, mm -hmm. and I do think, um, I personally would like to go back and, and just take a look at the, the law and make yeah. sure I understand how that intersects with this, um, yeah. with these pages of the, um, of the handbook. Mara, just, just very, very quickly, mm -hmm. um, I was reflecting on everything you just said about, you know, wanting students know that there are adults there that are supporting them and that, you know, not to sort of make everything punitive. And I think a little bit what I'm getting at in terms of like what, just to be clear about what I would like to see, because mm -hmm. I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying like it has to be this for everything, right? Mm -hmm. But I think some of what you were talking about as I was reflecting on it, I was like, yeah, that sounds like the work of, like that we're hoping our adjustment counselors are doing, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I would just like to see some consistency amongst the schools of if it's not, an incident in terms of something that we would, you know, be working with our adjustment counselors and trying to re-regulate a student. But it is something that needs that discipline because I do think it's important within the building. And I mean, you're the you're the, the principal, and you can you know obviously um, tell me if in your experience this is not right. But that I think it has to be clear that there are obviously the whole school community is there to support and help students who need it, but that there is also a strong hand at the steering wheel mm -hmm. that is gonna ensure that every member of that school community is safe. Mm -hmm. And a little bit what I'm getting at is part of what I have heard from certain parents is that certain schools are more lax than others mm -hmm. when it comes to certain things. And I mean, I will grant you that that's generally a parent who's saying my kid got in trouble for this and I'm angry about it. <laughs> so like, totally, and mm -hmm. then it's like, the other kid who lives over here did the same thing and it wasn't a big deal. So I guess my point is, I would just, 
I think that everything you're saying is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that, because I think without that strong hand, and I'm not saying any of our principals aren't providing that strong hand, but so that we can point to the parents and say, this is what we've put in place mm -hmm. to make sure that outside of making sure everyone is, is supported and everything like that, that we can ensure everyone is also safe. Mm -hmm. And I think the safety and supportiveness of all of our students' lives from the top down. Principals, yeah. teachers, the families, and the kids. Um, and I think we all play a role in yeah. that, in that um, responsibility. Um, and I think that you know, clearly defining what each of our roles is, yeah. um, is important. That's kind of what I'm getting at, mm -hmm. is I feel like some of what you were talking about, I was like, that is totally what I'm hoping our adjustment counselor is doing. Mm -hmm. But then what is it our principal, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like what those. And I think to be honest, the challenge is that when, at least for me, when I have a half-time adjustment counselor, the other half of the time, I'm the mental health of provider in the building. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of, it's hard to get it consistently yeah. when you have mm -hmm. someone who's learning two school cultures, yep. like mine is with mm -hmm. um, with the Balch and here. Um, and so hopefully in the future that may be something that can be addressed, but um, that is a challenge yeah. as well. And not that's not an excuse, but that's one hurdle that we have to overcome as administrators. Right. right. So I think, um, we want to hold off and we will do a little bit more work on this. We'll get a little bit more information on the blue pages and things like that. Um, and so maybe table this until um, our second meeting in June because I think, I know we have, we have one, we have both the high school and the middle school scheduled to come in to discuss their handbooks and I don't remember what the order is, but uh, the it's high school. The first. high school is coming the fifth and the middle school is coming the 19th. Okay. It was the other way around, but they swapped. Swap. Okay. Is, is there any way they can come on the same night? Um, I know that they weren't available. Yeah, on the, the problem fifth. is is that there's been so many things. Everybody is the handbooks are not all done. So, um, I mean, I can check with that, but there's been a lot of other work that's been going on that's been distracting from the main work around budgets, yeah. staffing, moving all those other things that we're trying to prepare for two possible outcomes on the fourth for the fourth of June. So um, things are I, not I, I, things I are I don't mean to be a pain what do we mean they're not done? Like is it or what's is it the high school and the middle school that aren't done or is it is it the one we're talking about that's not done? What's not done? The, I don't know if they're done with their process and have it all all, all the papers, all the markups there and they're done. I gave them due. I gave them due dates of the fifth oh. of of June, so I don't know whether it. I'm just. I think the the question is: Is could we consolidate them both to the ninth? Would that be too difficult? Was I, that? I I don't know. I don't know where the where the middle school is, but I can ask. Who's who is supposed no, to come? You were saying the nineteenth, which is the last. I'm sorry, the nineteenth. Yeah, the last one. Like I don't really care about the date. I'm really trying to see if we can get them consolidated on the same day. Um, let's uh, table that until we get to the point where we're looking at the long-term agenda and, and okay. trying to s discuss what's happening at each meeting. Um, all right, any other questions for Mr. Riley tonight? <laughs> Just a quick comment. Um, I, I think you and all the elementary principals work so well mm -hmm. together and I appreciate all the work that you already do. <laughs> um, so. I, I don't want anything I said to come off in a negative Absolutely time. not. Got it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Shall we move on to budget? All right. Ms. Ellis, are budget transfers? Yes. Um, the first one I'll discuss um, was on our last school committee meeting agenda and how we put off to today. Um, so that's Principal Riley's. Um, request to transfer uh, from his supply account P0965 the amount of three thousand five hundred six dollars sixty five cents into P account 0874 which is the textbook line um, for his classroom library refresher okay um, Maura motion to approve is there a second thank you Teresa um, and I just want to point out that um, we're at this point talking about classroom libraries, meaning the, the yeah. small stash of books <laughs> right, yeah. that each 
exists in each classroom. This is, we, we've made several mentions of the fact that we do not have a budget for library books, and that means the books that are in each school library. Uh, and, but we clearly didn't have enough for the classroom libraries either because we're transferring money into that. Mm -hmm. um, any further discussion? Teresa? Just so everybody in the public knows, um, you know, in this budget transfer, um, Mr. Riley does mention that the PTO is also supporting this effort by raising money for some of the books in addition to the budget transfer. Yes. We definitely um, appreciate all the efforts of the PTO. Any um, further discussion? Yes. I'm assuming that these are all one copies, and if you got multiple copies, you would not be disappointed to have more than one copy? Correct. There's a couple where we might have two copies that's really popular, right. um, but it is mostly a single copy in those classrooms. Is there any way we get a published list somewhere to say these are books, and if anybody has extra copies, I know I have several copies of the same book at home. I'd be happy to give them to you if it aligns with what you're looking for. All right. Um, any further discussion? Put it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Okay. We have another budget transfer. Yep. This one's from Balch Principal Ferreira. Um, it's for group furniture for a classroom that's considered for blended learning. Um, so she'd like to transfer from the account 0870, the Balch textbooks, $12,000 to her P account 1259, which is the rep and rep replace and repair account where we purchase our furniture from. And Ms. Ellis, refresh my memory, I believe that the repair and replace budget were places that we slashed the budget last year. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Not to zero, but not to zero, right, reduced. But we, we reduced significantly. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Thank you, Maura. Is there a second? Thank you, Dave. Any further discussion? Maura? Uh, just very quickly, um, reading Principal Ferrer's message here, I just think it's a, it's a, this particular budget transfer draws attention to how, you know, we are having to move things around to deal with the students that are in front of us. Mm -hmm. So I just think it um, really illustrates how we within the schools are able to uh, address those needs as they come up, mm -hmm. as they do come up. Teresa, did you have a comment? Just a, just a question. What was, I know the 12000 was originally like the textbook account, but was there anything specific that we thought we were going to be spending that money on? Um. I, I don't know. Um, Dr. Wyatt, do you? Yeah, I, I was going to guess. Did, did I'd have Walsh to go. Did already have more foundations materials than we thought yeah. originally? Yeah, actually that's, I think you, yeah. you hit it on the head because right. they had. I think, I think we budgeted for yeah, foundations they were using it before. materials right. and they already had some because they were doing it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oh, that's instructional salaries. That was a good thing. Is that last, this is last year's. I know, but it's the last year's budget is in this book too. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. 603 would be the section. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the, the total budget for Balch textbooks for last year was $22,698. So it's not like they're zeroing out that account. Oh, yeah, sure. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll put it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. And Ms. Ellis, one more? Yeah. Uh, this is for Coakley Middle School Principal Frazik for her paper needs. Um, she'd like to transfer from 0653, her conferences, $900, to her P account 0931 for administrative instructional supply. All right, is there a motion to approve? Thank you, Dave. Is it second? Thank you, Teresa. Any further discussion? Joan? So I just want to make sure I understand. She's moving money from professional development for teachers to be able to buy laminating film mm -hmm. and paper. It's yep. from conferences, yes, to um, her paper supply. Okay. Thank you. When you when you when you don't actually do a reasonable increase in your supply lines, eventually you get caught and you don't have enough money. All right. Um, all those in favor. Unanimous. All right. Thank you very much. Um, 
and then uh, yeah, at our budget update for this year. Yep. So this uh, yellow copy is your canned report from the present um, financial package. Um, so I'll just quickly remind everybody that the first three pages are usually the carryover. And that would be the encumbrances carried over from the previous fiscal year and how they closed out in the remaining months. Um, then on page um, four, it begins your FY19 expenditures. Um, from there, I'm going to move over to our spreadsheet, which is the FY19 budget projection as of April 30th, 2019. This is an exact copy of what this um, report states with our projections as far as the remainder <coughs> two months, May and June, um, anticipated uh, salary expense and anticipated operational expenses. Are there any particular areas of concern this year? Um, well, we still have two more months to go through. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've made commentaries over in the column lines um, just to refresh everybody's memories uh, of what we've already talked about. Um, there's no real areas of concern when I do want to bring you down to um, the special ed section. Um, and I do want to remind everybody on the school utilities, we're still reviewing um, the gas accounts that we had noted and also the electric buildings, <coughs> electricity lines as well. Mr. Riccardi and I met with the electric light department yesterday. Um, we're still doing some more research, so when we have something to bring to you, we'll report on that. Okay, great. Um, just trying to find my sheet came out the wrong way. <laughs> Okay, so page 13 of 14, um, I'm just pointing out that we haven't made any of our um, journal entries as of yet, um, but in doing our projections with our anticipated salary and expenditures, um, in the section of 6180, Special Ed and Student Services, <coughs> we've used 820,000 so far on our circuit breaker um, in order to end with a positive balance of 31,955.71. And again, we have two more months worth of um, transactions to go through. Okay. Question for you. Mm -hmm. So when we see uh, expense for retirement, is that a payout of sick, earned sick time, vacation time? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Teresa? Um, so on page one, uh, 1700, the special report here, um, it says grant fee struck. Can you remind me what that was? Yeah, the 240 grant, the special needs grant, um, no longer would allow for the administrative assistant to be charged to it. Okay. So it's a reconstruction of the grant itself. And it, it wasn't us. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And again, that is that is kind of the challenge. We don't really get numbers for the grants until and new rules until late July, early August, mm -hmm. um, after we've already finished the budget process. Did we did we lose funds or it was just no? No, no. no it's just we could not use we could not use the grant towards that. Towards that. Okay. Salary. And did we find another use for it? Did we find another use for that amount from the grant? Yes. Yep. And what? But it's it just not there. It's yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure that it would be other salaries or other contracted services. It's within the grant itself. Okay. It's like saying, you know, okay, red will qualify, but blue won't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Any other questions? Joan? Um, can we look at 6160 on page 13? Um, sorry, could you, which page? Um, page 13. P code 6160, school transportation totals. That seems to be like a big differential. I wasn't sure we knew why that was. 
have to use a bus that we don't have enough capacity, I believe. Is that there? That was a question last time. Is it this one, the transportation? It on our transportation budgets? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because when we budget for that, we take the offset of $200,000 from the revolver. Okay. We just haven't applied it to this okay. right here. So that differential isn't what you're actually anticipating will end up? We yeah, we may or may not have to because okay. really we, you have bottom line autonomy. Okay. So if we don't have to use the revolving funds, we won't. Got it. Okay. And save them for the next year with the bus costs. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other items on the budget? All right. Thank you very much. Um, for, for the budget, I'm going to pass the folder around so you guys can sign up budget transfers. There's three of them in there. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda, we are moving into old business, and so we're talking about the um, school building committee. Um, as you know, we are in the eligibility period for the MSBA with the project for the new middle school. Um, I signed the, um, it's like a certificate of yeah, C -C -S -I, the compliance. compliance certificate. Yeah, it had a very long name, but <laughs> it was basically like listing all the laws and, and um, regulations that we had to be aware of, and I did share that document with all of you. Um, and uh, one of the next, so that was due May 31st, so uh, that was signed by uh, Dr. Thompson, by Mr. Mizuko, and myself, and that has been sent off to the MSBA, so we have checked off the first to do on the MSBA list for the eligibility period. Um, one of the next items is uh, to name a school building committee. Uh, the school building committee, I believe, is really under the purview of the Board of Selectmen because they have control of all town-owned buildings. And so um, they will name the final configuration of the committee, but we need um, at least one school committee member who will serve on that committee. Um, I didn't actually print out the list of who serves on the committee, but I will tell you it um, has to include someone who is certified in public procurement. It has to include the, the town manager and the superintendent. It has to include a budget person or a member of um, FinCom. I believe it's going to be a member of FinCom. It has to include at least one school committee member. It must include the person responsible for building maintenance, so Mr. Riccardi will be serving on that committee. Um, it has to include someone who is familiar, did I mention this building principal already? So Margot Friesick will serve on that committee. Um, someone who is familiar with the educational requirements of the building. Um, a community member who is uh, familiar with architecture or engineering or construction or some combination of all three. Um, so it's, and it, this is an ongoing commitment. Um, we are in the eligibility period right now, of which we will be in for a period of nine months, but then, um, or maybe it's six months, but. Um, 270 days. Yeah, nine months. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, uh, but then after that, we do hope that we will um, be moving forward with doing the feasibility study and then moving forward into additional phases with the MSBA. And so um, I'm currently looking for um, volunteers to serve on the school building committee. As I said, it's up to the Board of Selectmen to name the ultimate committee, but they certainly um, would allow the school committee to select our own representative. When would the committee meet? Is it, is it like a public forum? Is it a, I'm assuming it is. I don't know that it has to be publicly posted meetings. I, I don't think it's a public meeting, but many of the people that would be on that committee would probably have day jobs, so usually they're early evening meetings. Early evening. Okay. Although also a lot of the people on that committee are, are town employees and, mm. you know, people who, so I'm not, nobody has set when oh, meetings okay. right. would happen. Right. I don't even know if there will be a meeting until maybe the fall, to be honest with you. But. Yes, I, would, I would love to help just depending on time wise as a full time job. I could do it during the day. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I'm interested. Okay. Teresa? I'm interested, but with the reverse. 
<laughs> so depending on how it is, you have coverage. <laughs> So maybe what we will do is we can um, suggest, we can submit two names mm -hmm. and um, we, the requirement from the MSBA is there has to be at least one yeah. school committee member. Um, uh, unless the Board of Selectmen objects, I think it's certainly fine for us to have two mm -hmm. um, school committee members. And so if uh, Dave and Teresa want to do that, we can certainly try to put both of you on that committee and then see what happens in terms right. of schedules. Now, schedules. is it, I'm just trying to understand, like, do they expect the same person every meeting or could we both be there and, and relay back to the committee what's going on? I think ideally there's consistency for the committee because I really, with the MSBA process, there is a lot of detail and a lot of requirements and, and so um, certainly people could choose to attend the meetings to watch and there um you know it'd be great if whoever is representing we i fully expect that whoever is our representative there will bring information back to the school committee but i think we really need somebody who's willing to commit to reading all of the and keeping track of all of the requirements and right. it's sure. you know the msba has is a wonderful program but they are quite regulated on in how they do things and um so. and, and i know in town meeting etc people have talked about how this is coming real soon after override coming real soon but let's be clear this is a long process can you just give us a timeline again of how long this takes uh, uh about process, eight, years between eight years when yeah. you start and when you would open the door and start paying on the loan right so again as i said to people before it's 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 almost a decade, but it's, it's a long time from now. Mm -hmm. yeah. My second right. grader won't even be at this yeah. new middle school. No, <laughs> no, but, there, but it, I'm, it, we, I certainly hope that we will be putting this before the voters of Norwood before eight years. Yeah. I mean, we will right. be, we right. be looking we would, for we be authorization looking, right. much before that, but it wouldn't necessarily hit taxes in full until we were, you know, for we several left. years. So we open the doors. Yeah. I believe it's 2024 that it's slated to open if everything right. goes and that's well. and, and just a just as a caveat that's if we hit every well, target well we can hit the target and they can say oh come back next year oh. so you can do a circle I mean that's that's a direct line so you could like we could finish you know the first period and say well we want you to go back and do this or we're not going to move you forward into the next fad and not so much in feasibility, but oftentimes when it comes between feasibility and writing plans, you know, sometimes they'll ask for right. more plans. Or you finish the plans and they don't like the plans and you have to spend more time. So or that's even, a best case scenario is right. or 2024. Even you, you have the plans and they like the plans and they just don't have the money that year mm -hmm. to right. fund and they have to prioritize. Right. Right. When we went to the MSBA meeting when we were formally elected into the eligibility period. We were very fortunate that we were um, chosen to participate in that program in the eligibility period the very first time that we submitted. But there were other school districts there that had submitted multiple years in Four a row. Four or five years in a row to get in. Before yep. they got in. So, um, but I do have the, the little flow chart in front of me. Um, <laughs> So uh, we, in the fall of this year, we will be asking for um, town approval for the feasibility study and schematic design. That work would be completed during the 2020 year, calendar year, so through December 2020. Um, then possibly early in 2021, the, um, the MSBA could decide to offer us assistance with actual building and you know reimbursement for for building in which case in the spring of 2021 so two years from now we would be looking for approval from the town to go forward with the project uh, but it would then take at least a year before construction began so that would be 2022 that construction would begin and we would expect it to last um, at least three years 
So I think we're looking at 2025 before a school would be open. Um, wow. And we did start this process at the beginning of 2018. So that's that, you know, seven, eight year mm -hmm. time that it takes. If you get the approvals the first time you ask and, and that some of it is whether or not they like your plan and some of it is whether, you know, how much money they have and, and you know, it, it's not just a question of standing in line. There's a process where they look at priority and they try to figure out, um, you know, which schools are most desperately in need. So even if people have asked for a couple of years in a row, they still may need to wait if somebody else comes in with, you know, a roof that's partially caved in or, mm -hmm. you know, something right. horrendous that happens. Right. And I'll just say part of the reason why we did get into the uh, um, in, into the process on the first get go is the building is in such dire condition that it needs it's jumped some other people because of the HVAC system and several other pieces of that building. So, and as Teresa has pointed out, the MSBA was really focused on overcrowding, and mm -hmm. uh, the Coakley does meet that standard that it is mm -hmm. overcrowded. Yeah. Core, core facilities not up to mm -hmm. where they should be, overcrowd, it hit all the markers, so. <laughs> no. Which are not good markers. No. <laughs> it's not good. Yeah. All right, um, any further discussion on that? Okay, um, then we get to our long-term agenda, and so we want to um, just want to return to this practice of trying to lay out what's before us at each meeting. Um, at our next meeting on June 5th, we will, uh, we know that we would like to um, recognize the spring athletes. That's what we had, on, what we meant by this. And we talked to plan to um, look at the high school handbook. I'm sorry, Teresa, did you have a question? Oh, no, that's oh. funny. <laughs> okay, Maura? Um, I don't know if it's a question um, or just a concern. June fifth is two days after the vote. Yes. If the vote fails, yes. I just feel like we're gonna need other things. Oh, absolutely. To talk about there, and then just is yes. it, I don't know whether this is a reason to move it or not, but recognizing the spring athletes two days after they've discovered there will be no spring, or they'll have to pay over a thousand dollars. Is that a little? Salt in the wound. Do you want to give that a little space to breathe, just in case? <laughs> I, I I think maybe the thought was, if you're looking at the 19th, your seniors who might be part of that group would not be anywhere in the neighborhood. So that's right. kind of why we did the fifth. But um, and, and in terms of um, the high school students, their last day of school is Thursday the 20th. Mm -hmm. So their last day of finals is Wednesday the 19th. So at roughly noon on Wednesday the 19th, they're basically on summer vacation. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how many students would then choose to come to the school committee meeting at 7 p.m. on their first free night of freedom. <laughs> but I guess that was also part of my concern is if you find out there's not going to be anything, how many students are going to come? Right. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. It just yeah. optically seemed like. We don't have the ability to say tentative. <laughs> Depending no. on the vote. Well, you, we can certainly, I mean, this long-term agenda document is something that we use internally for planning purposes, right? right? right. That the, I, we started this a while ago trying to, because we would find that we would think of something that we wanted to have on the agenda, and we wound up having really uneven agendas. Some would be hours long and others wouldn't have that much on it and we wanted to be able to say, oh, that's something important, but let's find a time that's yeah. right. mm -hmm. not quite as crowded. Um, so we can certainly be flexible on this. However, we can't wait until we know the, um, the yeah. outcome of the vote before we set the agenda for our June 5th meeting because yeah, open meeting losses, we have to have the agenda 48 hours in advance. So we're gonna we slightly miss that deadline. Maura? My suggestion would be, and I mean, we can, it's the well, well the committee obviously about the spring athletics, but I would think about possibly moving the high school handbook to the 19th and moving up 
um, CMS new club proposals and electives, um, and then possibly also adding something in about athletics or sports as a placeholder in case it fails so that we are, I mean, if it fails, we're going to have to hit the ground running with figuring out policies and everything else for oh, that to play. Yeah. So it strikes me maybe be talking about the clubs and things like that um, um, on there. Yeah, actually, actually, the high school asked not to be the 19th because that is uh, their end of year faculty event. Okay. So, um, so that's why originally we had the middle school coming the fifth and the high school coming the 19th, but they had asked if they could swap with the middle school. So that's why they kind of over. Plus, if there's no override, we're probably not talking about new club proposals and electives at CMS. That's probably that's why they're at, on the 19th, because if the override does not pass, the new club, pro, the, the new electives that will go along with revamping the Mustang block will not be on the table. So, Because the schedule will be changed. All right. But so I think let's try and move spring athletics to the 19th. I mean, I don't know how many students we'll get, but we'll see, right? Um, Let's leave the high school handbook where it is because that's when Dr. Galligan is available to come talk to us. And it doesn't mean we have to do the final approval that night, but I do think if he's booked that time to come talk to us, then we should make use of that. Um, and we definitely should add some policies to this night. Um, so we would talk again, uh, maybe perhaps about the social media and perhaps about um, Donations, right? Because that was um, kind of the yeah. So clarify for me what you want in terms of donations by June. I think it was just we, you know, especially if the if the override fails, we wanted to have another conversation about uh, donations. I don't think that's necessarily something you need to write between now and then. Just so more here's some information, research on it. Let's discuss, figure out how to move forward. If yeah. We need to. Yeah. I, I think also. Um, Part of the point is we have to set an agenda prior to knowing whether the vote passed or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So having something on there as a placeholder in case. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That that's sort of what I was getting at with moving the clubs up is like, even if we can't actually fund it, we can say then we can't fund it and have mm -hmm. something on there about mm -hmm. activities to talk about. Right. That was more what I was getting at. Yeah. Okay. Um. But I think we want Dr. Frazik to come to talk about the handbook on the 19th so yeah. that we can talk about all of them. Right, we're trying, I, I mean, it, it is between concerts and the year activities, it's pretty crazy. And I'm trying to have the high school one night and the middle school another night as opposed to having them have to come both nights. Um, what other items uh, do we want to be sure are on the agenda? We, um, I mean, we can, this is not like a final list. We obviously will add things. But. Well, I think we need to start figuring out our timeline for Dr. Thompson's evaluation. Yes. Um, let's start talking about that at our next meeting on the 5th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even if we just do what we did last year, like flesh out the timeline of, yep. you know, when the Google Docs going to be yep. created, when do we want all the evidence in the folders, when do we want the drafts done, and mm -hmm. all that. Right, right. Uh, the criteria are already set. Mm -hmm. The um, evidence that we've requested is already set. Mm -hmm. But we need, we will need to make sure we have a timeline about that. Yeah. OK. Um, Mark, we should put back on here the elementary handbook since we have to re look at that. Yep, we'll put that on for the 19th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on here, it does say that we're going to talk about summer meeting schedule on the 19th. I think we, we currently have one meeting scheduled for August. Mm -hmm. We do not have a meeting for July. Mara? I was going to suggest because I, that reminded me because I, I think we should move something from the 19th to the 15th or the 5th, excuse me, and I would actually suggest moving that up to yep. the 5th because mm -hmm. if there is no override, yeah. we're going to have to add meetings. Yes. Yeah. Even if it's we can't all be there, yeah. Yeah. whatever dates we can actually get a quorum, we will have to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's do that and um, 
if we decide we don't need to add meetings, then we may yeah. need to do what we did last year, which is nominate someone to sign warrants on behalf yep. of the committee mm -hmm. over the summer so that we can um, not bring the business office to a complete and total halt right. while we <laughs> take a month off. Yeah. Um. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody raised your hand up here. <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay. If anybody thinks of anything else they want to add. Oh, got something well, now? Well, this is kind of, I, I, I don't know whether it, it's, if it's something we want to talk about in terms of an executive session, is that something to talk about now or later? Uh, we could put an executive session to well, look, more what my, my thought was is listening to Principal Riley we were kind of having a conversation about consistency in terms of safety and one of the things that made me remember is I think it was two years ago when we had that like safety summit mm -hmm. and Teresa had suggested that we, oh, did we do another mm -hmm. yes it might not be a bad idea to do like every other year absolutely because it, it, like, one of the things I, I realized is like there's so many nights we're asking everyone to be out, right? But like, it would have been helpful to have everyone here. But like, I get it. You're like, everyone has lives. Like, this is exciting and all that. <laughs> I get. It. So I, it's like maybe to have something and with Chief Brooks and things like that, just to like with everything that's going on in the world, having I think in every other year check in where everyone is in the same room on just that topic mm -hmm. isn't the worst idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's a, the safety task force that's part of the strategic right. plan. And, um, uh, you know, it, we do have many safety plans in place, but yeah, they always can use review and, mm -hmm. and um, discussion. So um, I, would, I would just say that we're not discussing safety plans in public, correct? No, it's right. no, that was the session. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that is one of the the allowable reasons to go into executive session. Awesome. And my thought was maybe early summer before people have gone, before school's technically over, it might just be easier to get people together. Or in the fall. Doesn't really matter. My day is becoming infinitely. Yeah, I, I was going to think that. I was going to, you know, because we, you know, we had that group that went to the tech training on on safety mm -hmm. and, and, and risk assessment, and they're going to start working in August. So mm -hmm. some of the changes yeah. we'll be talking about will be for you know next year during the fall, and that is. Yeah. In terms of timing on the schedule, does executive session have to be the end of the agenda? Because no. okay, good. No. it doesn't. We can start well, so early. There's, there's probably a lot of people that wouldn't want to hang all the way. No, the last time we did <laughs> it, it was in the middle of the afternoon. It, it was, oh, it was during the day. The day. Yeah. yeah. And we had the we had the police chief and the fire chief there as well. So. Yeah. Right. And it wasn't the entire committee. It was three yeah. Well, the there. entire committee was invited. Right. It was almost all of us. I think. I think, I think we all were there. Yeah, we yeah. were all okay. there. Yeah, I think we okay. were. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but uh, yeah, you, you can have an executive session that is a standalone meeting. That mm -hmm. uh, yeah. we tend to do them at the end of our public meetings because then the camera crew can go home and yeah, you know not hang around and wait for us. But um, but it's also permissible to schedule something that's just an executive session and there, right. it's not open to the public. Um, the, and, and you know, as Dr. Thompson said, we did have um, police and fire there, we had buildings and grounds, we had, uh, Mr. Kidd was there for technology because that has a, um, mm -hmm. you know, like he's aware of the camera systems and the student information systems and, and all of that stuff. And um, we had all the building principals and um, head of guidance was there mm -hmm. and yeah. um, some others, I think. I just can't think of who else mm -hmm. was there. But, yeah. but it's, it's not just um, about fire alarms. Right. You know, <laughs> not that those aren't important, but. Um, so, I think maybe what I'll do is I'll try and send out a doodle poll on yeah. when we can do a safety evaluation uh, discussion. Um, and I would ask uh, somebody can check in with Joe Kidd about uh, which is uh, training at the office about phishing. You know, getting spam emails, and that might be good for all of our teachers, administrators to know the risks of opening emails. It may look like you're getting Netflix free for a month from the school department, <laughs> but you're not. Yeah. So we've don't get, click on we've it. Get, we get pretty good filters and oh, yeah. there, well, is, there is periodic reminders when things are coming around. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. 
Okay, um, and then I want to remind everyone that uh, according to our school committee policies on the, at the second meeting in June, that is the formal um, school committee reorganization. So that time we um, elect a secretary who has always been the superintendent um, and a, a chair and a vice chair for the following year. Okay. Um, and then we, we may want to talk about um, some other committee assignments and things like that. It's a, a good time to kind of have that, those discussions. All right, anything else? Dr. Thompson, if the override doesn't pass, is there anything that you think you need us to discuss on the fifth? I know so many moving pieces will be happening, but is that more administrators at that time? That'll, that'll be all, all us and all buildings and grounds and all hands on deck. I mean, the, the decisions have already been made, so I don't know what we would, okay. unless we wanted to cry together. <laughs> we can arrange to do that, but maybe not on camera. But, uh, <laughs> It's just, it's, ex it's executed in the plan. Okay. So. Okay. Anything else under the long-term agenda? If anybody thinks of anything they want to add, remember that agenda is one of the few things we're allowed to talk about outside of the meeting. So feel free to um, send an email. Okay, superintendent's report. Dr. Thompson. Yes, just um, just real quick. Um, well, actually, maybe not real quick, but I, I want to give a shout out to uh, my colleague, Dr. Wyeth who was a panelist uh, for the uh, WGBH uh, Public Television on uh, project-based learning. There were 104 participants participating in that, and he was invited to be a panelist. So I don't know if you want to share a little bit more about that. I have his slides here, and we know it was him because I have a picture right here. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a doppelganger, it was actually Dr. Wyatt. So could you tell us a little bit about this experience? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it was a it was a wonderful thing to participate in. Um, it was coordinated by um, WGPH, and they had a um, project-based learning um, consultant expert on there, sort of facilitating the conversation, named Susie Boss, um, and she's written a lot of books on the topic. And so, we also were we um, uh, had a conversation with Karen Sean Hines, who is a seventh grade. English language arts teacher from Timothy Middle School in Roxbury, and Kenneth Hansen, who is a high school technology teacher, much like Mike Crowley, in um, Marlboro from Marlboro High School. And so we were basically talking about they were sort of sharing some of their project-based um, learning ex um, activities and experiences in their schools and what the what benefits they got from them, especially their kids. And then I uh, was there as sort of a, as an administrator sharing you know what are some of the, the powers of project-based learning and what are the obstacles to power-based learning uh, project-based learning and how do we try to overcome those and so it was a good conversation and they're going to continue it was the second of a series and they're going to continue it in the summer i think and try to get maybe my recommendation was for them to get a, a really an administrator group to talk about how can school administrators really support and nurture pro more project-based learning in their schools given its effectiveness and its power so um, i'm hoping that'll happen and you know it's it's an ongoing conversation that they're kind of committed to which is great and they provide a lot of resources to schools i, mean, I don't know if you've gone on their website but i've shared that with our faculty and you know added it to our resources uh, list as well um, if they want to start small with a project-based learning idea, how to grow it, and, and um, they've heard it from me multiple times that I will support this in any way, shape, or form uh, because I think it's the best education going for kids, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Right. And it, it fits with all of our, our strategic plan initiatives and everything else. So I'm a big proponent of it. And, and uh, by the way, um, I sent out a, um, a Google sheet asking people in the district if you're doing some project activities to let us know so that we can kind of get a sense of what's already happening in Norwood and I got a lot of wonderful responses or additions to that document which I'm happy to share with you you know later if you want but we've got a lot already happening in Norwood especially you know at the elementary and middle school level and some at the high school level um, and I think that's a great thing so we just need to grow it my hope is if we get the override 
that we can really sink some professional development monies in this area and, and help sort of move that work forward with, with some support for our faculty, you know, professional development resource support. So, so, so Dr. White, for, for, those, for those at home who don't understand what project-based learning, I mean, what, you mentioned the powers. What would you, in a sentence or two, well, say is the power of project-based learning? Yeah, well, it asks kids to, first of all, it gives kids a lot of choice and voice in, in what they sort of sink their teeth into. Um, and it, it asks kids to work in groups or in pairs, sometimes three or four, um, kids together on a project so that and ask them to develop skills around their you know collaboration and teamwork and problem solving um, which they often don't get in just a regular classroom where it's just sort of individual you know student performance um, happening for the most part um, so um, it really gives them a skill set for the 21st century you know to, to use the lingo um, where they're asked to um, think critically, um, d go deep with a, with a particular project, answer oftentimes a question that is worth thinking about and answering and trying to come up with solutions for. The best projects often are tied to community efforts and interests. So, um, and, and I've seen these in, in coalition schools where at the end of the project it's a big celebration and demonstration of the kids work and you've got parents coming in you've got professionals coming in that have been tied into the projects um, as, as sort of experts and resources and just having a celebration of, of the kids work uh, it it also ties into creating a portfolio for each kid so that the kid can say to colleges or whatever you know a career or workplace here's an example of the work I have done. And it's very real, it's authentic. That's another value to project-based learning. So it's not some hypothetical, theoretical kind of thing. It's real and it has a purpose and a service to the community oftentimes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so then the other thing I wanted to spend a little time on, I, I've been asked uh, by a couple people to talk about uh, the plans going into uh, the June 3rd, 3rd ballot vote and the day after. Um, so, so June 4th is going to be a big day uh, in the Norwood Public Schools. We're gonna have to move in either one direction or the other and there has been concurrent planning for both. Um, so uh, as the committee knows, they did notify them and the staff know, uh, the teachers who are going to be reduced in force if the override does not pass have already been notified. They were notified last Friday. Uh, so they know that the override does not pass, they would not have a job uh, in the Norwood Public Schools. The elementary principals have been uh, planning for uh, specials and service deliveries and the chance that the override does not pass, what they would be, uh, and we would have to advertise for uh, those people to do that. Uh, the elementary uh, schools have also been planning the internal moves. We need to empty classrooms uh, in order to fill and push the kindergarten in. Um, so identifying what rooms those will be and who will be moving where. Uh, currently, we're starting to work on the kindergarten teacher assignments, which school they will go to, which rooms they will go with, and figuring those out. Uh, those will be done and ready to be dispersed on the 4th if need be. Um, for the last few months, we've been collecting boxes uh, in case there is a need to pack, because packing will need to start soon thereafter in that first week of June. Uh, we have a quote for moving the Willow Portable over to the Prescott, and we have assembled possible movers to help us move uh, and to get quotes from them should that need to happen. Uh, the moving part would probably not happen until July, so there's a little bit of a lag there. Uh, the middle school, uh, not having the override would obviously affect uh, grade eight. Uh, the middle school uh, will have to go back and reassign teams. Uh, electives will take a hit, especially uh, the new Mustang block, which is an intervention and extension block that's been designed by the staff. That would have to be put on hold, so that would uh, have to be redone. So there are plans for what that would look like in kind of a sketch. They're going to have to get down and actually make it happen on, uh, starting on the 4th. At the high school, um, so we've, uh, we've shared the preliminary, and I want to say a word again, preliminary, preliminary pay-to-play costs. Uh, the problem we have with actual hard costs is that we don't know 
what sports will actually be run. We don't know exactly how many athletes or band members will come out, and that will affect uh, the actual finite costs. There was a question about gate receipts. It's going to be very difficult to calculate gate receipts when you don't even know what sports you're going to be running. So these are preliminary numbers, and unfortunately, we'll be in a position where we're going to have to schedule uh, meetings, uh, information meetings, and we're going to need to collect full, fee full fees uh, right up front from people because we need a commitment in order to figure out Title IX ramifications and what we can run and what we cannot. Uh, the month of June uh, will be spent, um, would be spent redoing the high school schedule because we would not be able to meet uh, the student requests for their classes and there would be students who didn't, will not be getting uh, the classes that they want. So that's the um, one path and, and where we are on that. Um, the other path, uh, basically, it, should the override path, uh, there's going to be basically going to be two sets of postings. There are postings right now that are put up there and again they always say you know anticipating funding but those posts that are up there now are for retirements or resignations of positions that we will need to have no matter what road we go down uh, so those are up there but there will be two sets of postings ready to go up on the fourth we're in the process of putting them together uh, one is uh, for positions if there's not an override and I mentioned um, you know I mentioned the uh, the um, service delivery um, and art and such uh, at, the, uh, at the elementary school. Um, also possible for Spanish in the middle school, I'm not quite sure whether we need to add, because I think we laid off one more teacher than, than we actually need that will convert to a Spanish teacher, so we would need to post for that. Uh, in the yes uh, category, if it does pass, the, those additional positions that were in uh, the contingent budget would be advertised on the fourth. We are currently putting together those descriptions um, so that they can go up on the fourth, uh, as well as uh, the Oldham principal. So it is a very busy time uh, in our schools. Not only do you have two paths we're trying to plan so that we can start executing very quickly on June 4th, uh, but we also have the regular stuff of end of year of activities, um, uh, evaluations and summative evaluations of staff, which have been put off because of the planning for the other pieces. Um, and then the you know, the specter of having to redesign the schedule of the middle school and the high school. So that is a kind of a state of, uh, state of the state where we state are. State of emergency? Hmm? State of emergency, it sounds like. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. We're, we're trying, you're, normally at this time of year, you're finishing up and you're, tr and you're talking about executing one plan. You know, we're, we're trying to execute multiple plans. You know, we've got, you know, a, a plan for uh, an English language arts pilot but we won't know whether we're able to uh, determine those uh, in, in June or have to try to put that off until next year or next fall. So again, there's, there's all this plan, there's things sitting on the shelf and depending on what direction we go in depends on what things come off the shelf. Um, it's been a tremendous amount of work. I have to give um, you know, the, you know, the staff here the, and the teachers here a lot of credit for their patience going through this. Uh, a lot of thanks and appreciation to the administrative team who have um, worked twice as many hours as, as they would normally work at, you know, in this to try to get into a position because if we're not able to execute one or the other, we're not in that position, we will not be ready um, for September. So, um, but that's the state of the state. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, next item on our agenda is policy. Now we already talked about the social media policy, um, but I did want to um, talk about the policy subcommittee. Um, uh, Teresa has been doing that on her own. Um, and uh, so I was wondering if anyone is interested in working with Teresa. Joan, that would, are you willing to do that? that I'm willing to do that. Excellent. Thank you very much. So we will Thank appoint you. you to the policy subcommittee along with Teresa. Can she sign that in red pen somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> Can we have a start and end date? <laughs> There's a contract with that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no leaving me clause. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, the next thing is, um, 
approval of the food service union contract. This is the um, contract for the people who work in our cafeterias uh, it, from the period of the beginning of this current school year, so um, 2018 to 2021. Um, and the committee has uh, certainly seen this contract before. Um, and uh, there were some, um, uh, there are certainly some raises uh, associated with this. Um, one thing that we faced with the, um, with this contract is that the state law is changing regarding uh, minimum wage. And so we had to anticipate that change. And so um, this contract calls for a 2.5% increase for the current school year and then 25 for each of the next two years. Um, and uh, that means our, um, in uh, uh, FY21, we would be looking at um, pay rates from 1350 an hour, which I think maybe is going to be the minimum wage at that time, mm -hmm. yeah. um, to um, as much as 2130 per hour. Just so people are aware of the size of the, the contract. Um, so, is there, and Dr. Thompson, this contract has been approved by the union? Yes. Yep, the association actually, but yes. The association, yep. okay, thank you. Um, so, is there a motion to approve this contract? Thank you, Dave. Is there a second? Thank you, Teresa. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, I'll put it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Uh, unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, and I believe we probably have a contra uh, copy of that contract um, in one of these folders, and so we'll have to make sure we sign I this before. I think it's before. in the red. I think it's in that red folder. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Dr. Thompson, do we have donations? We, uh, we already had the NFAC donation. We Thank did, you very much. Right, but we have uh, some other ones. Uh, we have Pearson e e uh, Education. Uh, this is uh, a stipend from um, Jill Milton participating in a uh, in a research study with uh, with Pearson Education, which benefited her from learning what they were learning about. Uh, but we also got three hundred twenty-five dollars to. Uh, to use back in the district. Um, Excellent. And that will go probably towards curriculum materials and or PD. Uh, the next one is from a Harvard Pilgrim uh, Healthcare for $250, and that is a donation to the Willard School. Uh, we have a big Y donation for $3,500 to the Copley Middle School. Okay. Um, and then Lowe's Dedham, and this is part of the garden program here at the Prescott. For two hundred and fifty dollars is a gift card to buy some materials that we need to do things in the garden, and then um, we have uh, seven hundred and seven hundred twenty-seven dollars and thirty-two cents. That was easy, uh, which is uh, reimbursement for paying teachers for the enrichment program here at the Prescott All from right. the Prescott PT. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Thank you, Maura. Seconded by Dave. Any discussion? Put it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. Um, uh, personnel, Dr. Personnel, Thompson. Personnel, yes. Uh, we have a, a, a retirement to announce. Uh, Richard Simon, who teaches high school mathematics, will be retiring as of the 30th, and we wish him all the best. Uh, two resignations. Uh, unfortunately, Anne Marie Ellis, our Director of Finance and Operations will be uh, resigning and leaving us at the end of June. And Lauren Morton, uh, who is a half-time Balch Title I teacher, is also uh, leaving us on June 30th. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, so moving on to school committee agenda. Uh, Dave, would you like to start? I'll pass it down. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about why public education is so important. Um, most people, folks probably don't realize, but I'm from a family of immigrants. Both my grandparents, uh, grandfathers stepped literally off the boat 
someone else's taxes paid for them to get ESL training, someone else's taxes paid for them to get an education, someone else's taxes paid for them to partake in the system. Somebody gave them a loan to start their businesses. Their kids went on to become teachers, real estate agents, computer operators, so that's my parents, my aunts and uncles, and then their kids, my generation, went on to become lawyers, professors, teachers, business owners, and finance professionals. I think one of my cousins is a stockbroker, but I'm not really sure what she does. <laughs> so, um, but the point of that is, is that none of that is possible without public, public education, and you can stop and think about what that family story would have looked like if neither one of my grandparents had been able to learn English, go to public school, and actually access the American dream that we offer. So for me, that's why the public education is so important and we need to think about override and whether or not that's the type of society we want to continue to perpetuate. I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa? Uh, two quick things. So one, um, a couple weeks ago, I was here at the Prescott reading uh, to a bunch of the third graders in the library and um, they each wrote me these lovely notes that I just got the other day. Um, and I just want them to know, so please let them know, Mr. Riley, that I will keep these forever because I'm like a scrapbooker <laughs> and I keep many things. So yes, you are. Yes, I am. Yes. <laughs> paper person, oh, a photo person. I don't throw anything away, <laughs> much to my husband's chagrin. But um, <laughs> these I will definitely be keeping. And they were really, they were very sweet. Um, and I just want to read one of them to you because there's like 25 of them here. <laughs> um, but one of them wrote, um, thank you for reading What Do You Do With a Chance? That's the book that I read to the class. Um, thank you for reading it slowly. Also, thank you for reading it so nicely. Also, thank you for telling us what the boy was saying. Um, because throughout the story, I was asking them questions and engaging them in discussion on, well, what do you think he's trying to solve? And what would you do in this situation? Um, also, thank you for taking your time, and thank you for helping the Prescott School. Um, so it was just really sweet. And then a lot of the students said, um, you know, thank you to you and all of the school committee uh, for raising money. So they think we raise money, which is a little bit different than what we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, but there was a lot of them in here saying thank you to you and, and all of the school committee. So I just wanted you to know. Um, and I'm going to write back to the class a note and, and mail it to them. Oh, I love this. Um, and then on a separate note, I just wrote a brief statement that I want to read tonight. Um, so somebody said to me the other day when I was sharing numbers and statistics, um, they said people don't vote statistics. Um, people vote their values. And that really got me thinking and analyzing my own values. Um, so please indulge me for just a moment as I share some of my deepest beliefs and the core values that I hold dearly and guide me. Um, I believe in hard work. I value public health, public safety, and public education. I believe in integrated and holistic services that support the whole person and benefit all of society. I value integrity. I focus on doing what is right, even if it involves challenges. I promote advocacy, equity, and speaking up for others. I believe all people deserve respect. I believe that Nord's teachers, police officers, firefighters, public workers, and all other town employees deserve to be paid well and to be paid for all the work they do. I know, as cliche as it sounds, that it takes a village, and not just to raise children, but to encourage us all and to hold us all accountable to be good human beings. I aim to recognize those who have come before me, thank those for their efforts now, and to plan for the future. I hold children in the highest regard. They deserve to be respected, cherished, and supported. I consider kindness to be one of the most important values a person can hold, but I also believe in respect, tenacity, and resilience. I fiercely believe that together we are stronger than we are alone. I value community and collaboration. I believe in giving back. And these are the values that I am taking with me to the polls on June 3rd when I cast my vote for yes. I know I am not alone. I am confident that there are many in Norwood who share these same values. It is why we have chosen to make Norwood our home. We know what we have here, we know what our town deserves, and we know what we need to do to protect our future. So thank you. Thank you. Maura? Uh, yes, thank you. 
Um, I sort of, I had been writing and rewriting and then striking down things to say tonight <laughs> in a last ditch, you know, because I know it's our last meeting before the, the actual override vote. And it just strikes me that I don't know what else I could possibly say than what we have already said. Um, at this, our meetings, the informational meetings, the BBC meetings, town meeting, um, I think the information is very much out there. And I, I think that people who have had the information, you know, have sort of seen the, the situation for what it is. So I actually just want to take a second to say thank you to a lot of people, um, all of my colleagues here, the administrative staff, the faculty, um, the staff at all the schools, the, the kids, um, and especially everyone on the One Norwood Committee, the PTAs, the PTOs, the people on the Budget Balancing Committee, the FinCom, the Selectmen. I mean, this has been years of work. And I think that it's a real testament to everyone who volunteers their time, um, the superintendent, the general manager, um, to, to have gotten us here. And I remember, it's, it's interesting, because I feel like I've been on this committee for like a second and then also 50 years. Um, <laughs> but I remember when I was first elected, I ran on saying we don't have enough money and we have to close the structural deficit. And I had a lot of people, my friends, who said, this town will never even talk about an override. And here we are, you know, that our next school committee meeting will be after the vote for the override has happened. And I think sometimes we can get frustrated that changes happen slowly, but I just think it's worth pointing out that it took a lot of hands to turn a very large ship. And slowly as it may have been, we have turned. And I just think that that's worthy of, of uh, acknowledgement and thanks. Thank you. Did you? Yeah. Oh. So I, I really appreciate everything that's been said, and I don't have much more to say than what's been said over a long time. So speaking to the viewers at home <laughs> specifically, if you've been watching us here on school committee for the past year, you know uh, you have a pretty good understanding of what it is uh, at stake with the upcoming override vote just 12 days from now. Uh, we greatly appreciate that you are engaged in our community by taking the time to understand the issues and bearing witness to the difficult decisions that we've had to make here. Unfortunately for the vast majority of our residents, uh, this is pretty boring stuff. Uh, our Nielsen ratings are very low. We can't even get a single advertiser. Uh, and if you missed the previous season, uh, forget about it. Of course, I'm joking, but in all seriousness, not enough people are watching this like you are. So talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your relatives, heck, talk to strangers like I do while standing in line at the supermarket tell everyone how important it is that we preserve the very fabric of what makes Norwood such a great place to live by investing back in our town and our schools. I know that we can pass this override. I know that we must pass this override. So vote yes on Monday, June 3rd. Vote yes for a bright future for our town and for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for myself, I um I want to congratulate our seniors on finishing their high school careers. Um, they are now done with their classes <laughs> and um, looking forward to graduation at 1 p.m. on Sunday, June 2nd. Um, I hope many of you will be there with us that day. Um, and um, I wish them the very best. This class has a special place in my heart since my daughter's in this class. <laughs> um, so I remember very well when this particular class started at the Willett School. And um, it doesn't seem like that was that long ago. But, um, and like all of my colleagues, I do want to remind everyone that the polls are open on Monday, June 3rd from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And um, every vote counts. And so um, it's, you know, I will go with what the town, the sign in front of town hall says, it's your civic duty to vote. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we want to know what the voters of this town want and, and we will follow through with whatever that is. So, um, although I certainly hope that they vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, with that, I would like to um, ask for a motion to enter into executive session to discuss um, collective bargaining and uh, contract negotiations. So is there someone who can make that motion? Thank you, Dave. Uh, seconded by Teresa. Uh, to clarify, we would return to um, public session just for the purpose of adjournment. 
So now I need to poll Mora, yep. Teresa, yes. Joan, yes. Dave, yes. me, unanimous. Thank you very much.